Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Marantz and the model number is PM6004. In terms of general specifications RMS power output is 45 watts per channel when you connect 8 ohm speakers and this will increase to 60 watts if you're connecting 4 ohm speakers. The amplifier can have two sets of speakers connected and you can then select system A and system B or both and your maximum impedance for either of the channels will go to a maximum of 16 ohms. Total harmonic distortion is 0.07% and then for your input sensitivity for your Fano input you can connect a moving magnet type cartridge via a turntable at 2.2 millivolts with 47 kilo ohms impedance and then for your line input which is CD tuner auxiliary stroke DVD record 1 record 2 it's 200 millivolts 20 kilo ohms and then you have independent controls for your bass, treble and balance and you also have the loudness switch and if you wish you can bypass the tone control circuits by operating the direct mode and for private listening you can connect by the quarter inch headphone jack a set of headphones and via the system A and B switch you can disable the output then to the speakers weight is 7.4 kilograms and dimensions height is 105 by a width of 440 and a depth of 366 the amplifier is also supplied with a remote control. Now, what was the issue with this amplifier when it came into the workshop? Well, the report was that the power LED was flashing red and it wouldn't come out of that mode, which means that it is in protection. Now, when the top cover is removed or was removed, what you can see here is the power input protection fuse. Now, this power input protection fuse is in line with the power once the startup relay operates. And you can see the startup relay just to the left of where you see this fuse. And that, once energized by the microcontroller, will provide the power to the main power transformer. Now, when you see this type of issue, you can see that the fuse hasn't just failed. It's literally vaporized. So what's that telling you? Well, it's indicating that a very, very high amount of current has been drawn through the protection fuse. So what would typically cause that? Well, you may have a failure, for example, of either of the channels. Maybe the output transistors had failed, but not in this case. So it required further investigation. Now, what we show next is the toroidal transformer. And for this amplifier, the toroidal transformer is mounted inside of this housing and it's filled with a black epoxy resin or a sealant. Now, the way in which you would do the initial fault finding is that you have the connections which come from the secondary of the transformer. So what we need to do is just to verify that the excess current draw is not due, as I said, to maybe a failure on the amplifier board. So what you do is you will unplug the secondary connections from the amp board. So what that leaves you then is the power transformer and what we can do and we always test amplifiers via a dim bulb tester and I'll put a link in the description below to a video I made a number of years ago which is just an overview but it shows you the circuit and what we have is we have a 60 watt filament light bulb which is effectively in series and then what we're able to do then is to power up the amplifier after replacing the T1.6 amp fuse. Now as soon as we did that immediately the bulb lit very very brightly so that's telling you that there is a high probability that actually the failure here has nothing to do with anything on the secondary side of the transformer it's to the primary side now we could for example do further investigation on the startup board but what we do in this case is we disconnect the primary connection to the transformer and then here what I've done is I've just put it onto the bench and what I'm showing you is the electrical resistance measurement. And as you can see here on the primary of the transformer, it is 3.826 ohms. So that tells you straight away that unfortunately this transformer has failed and what we have are shorted turns on the primary. And then what I've done is I've just put a series of extracts from the service manual pointing now to the power transformer and then you can also see as well the blown protection fuse T1.6 amp and then we also mentioned the startup relay. So the circuit is such that you have the small transformer on the startup board that will then be rectified the secondary voltage. It will then be smoothed and regulated and then that will go to the microcontroller board. 
and it is the microcontroller of course which is receiving the inputs to verify that if correct startup occurs it should be seeing voltages appearing on the secondary of the power transformer i.e. powering the rest of the amplifier and if that doesn't happen then of course the amplifier will go into protection mode and that's when you get this LED which is flashing on the front and then here what you can see is the power supply and what, what is not too clear and this sometimes you get this between different service manuals even though it is the same manufacturer in the service manual for this amplifier it doesn't actually tell you what is the secondary AC voltages for the transformer what it indicates to you is what are the regulated voltages after rectification smoothing and you can see here that there are different voltage levels so we have the voltage which would be rectified and smoothed but not regulated which goes to the power output stages of the amplifier and then you also have as well the plus or minus 15 volt supply and then you can also see as well that there's a 12 volt supply etc. Now when I did some research the power output of this amplifier is identical to the PM6002 and even though they're indicating that it is a different part number, which it is because on the 6002 it's a toroidal, but it doesn't have that large metal casing and it's not embedded into this epoxy. Now, unfortunately, if you try and source the transformer for this amplifier, it's no longer available. But what I do hold in stock are transformers, replacements for the 6002. So the specifications that you see here match this amplifier because it's the same as the 6002. So when we look at the transformer specification that is shown here, you can see that the primary voltage input is 0 230 volts AC, and then it is a dual secondary. So we then have 28 0 28, and that is at 225 VA or watts, and then the other winding is 15 0 15 at 12 VA. So this transformer could be used to replace the obsolete transformer. When I first looked at the startup board and what I'm indicating here, clearly someone at some point must have been in here and maybe doing some checks and some tests. So the first thing became obvious, this is the two pin connector where the transformer primary connects. And what you can see is that the socket is slightly raised from the circuit board. And then when you undo the fixing screws and you turn it over, what you can now see is that there's cracking around one of the pins, but the other pin has pushed through the circuit board and it's actually pulled it away from the fiberglass material of the circuit board. And then what I've done is I've just zoomed in and you can see the issue here. So it's, it's straightforward to do. So the first thing is, is to rebond or to re-glue the copper track back to the circuit board. And then what you do is you just take a pair of pliers and you can just push down the pin which is too long back into the socket so it may contact. And then the other thing of course to do as well is as with all Marantz amplifiers and these can be the newer version or the older versions you do need to scan to make sure that there's no dry solder joints. Now this is a relatively newish amplifier but there was indication that there were some solder joints which probably could be improved. So as always, matter of course, we just reflow them. And then here what you can see is the replacement toroidal transformer. Now what I do is I actually mount this and you can't actually see it too clearly because it's, it's a white nylon material. And this is 110 millimeters by 110 millimeter square nylon plate. And it's a simple matter then of just drilling through the center hole. And then if you take the file transformer, you can then put the plate on and then you can mark up very accurately where the fixing screws will be for the replacement transformer. You can see also on the photograph that there is a rubber anti-slip mat as well. And then here what we've done is we've installed the transformer and I'll show you a number of additional shots in a moment. But the thing to highlight is that you can see the replacement fuse just to the right hand side of the startup relay. And then if we look from the top view, you can see that the fixing bolts are going through for the base plate. Now, when you've got these amplifiers disassembled, what I'm showing you now is the main amplifier board. And as you probably gather for anyone who regularly follows these tutorials, I'm always highlighting to you areas of additional work that you need to carry out in order to ensure that you have longevity for the repair. Not a simple matter of just fixing the specific issue, but doing remedial work. So 
As it again is morans, there are often dry solder joints and these are linked these to these stress points. So you can see here where you see the speaker terminals, there are solder connections to rectify or to re-solder there. And then you also find on the ground connections of these RCA sockets, there is multiple cracking. So all of these need to be reflowed. And then the other area where there seems to be quite a sparseness of solder the individual smaller circles on the left hand side of the circuit board are the various voltage regulators. And then you can also see one of the multi-pin sockets. And then often on the driver stage of the amplifier you can also see on some of the driver transistors as I've highlighted. Again lack of solder and dry solder joints so resolder them. Now what is a very very common issue which can arise from all of these amplifiers and many other amplifiers is in connection with the input selection. And I've covered this in previous tutorials. So this amplifier wasn't showing the issue in terms of randomly skipping inputs, but it would have done at a future date. So what I've done here is I've just disconnected the front fascia with the rear microcontroller stroke tone board and I've just put it onto the bench to work on it. So the way in which you will access the circuit board is that you need to remove it from the plastic bezel or fascia. So when you remove the input selection knob what you'll find is there is a locking nut so you need to remove that and then if you remove the knob then for the volume control what you'll find there is that there are two fixing screws so again remove those when you remove the balance, treble and bass knobs, there are no locking nuts behind there. And then here what you can see is the front bezel turned over and there are multiple screws that you need to remove. So once you've removed all of those, you can then unclip the circuit board from the front bezel. So here what you can see is the board removed. And then just towards the rear, what that is, is that is the power on off switch. You will need to remove two screws, move that out of the way before you can extract the circuit board. Now on the circuit board, what we're very interested in is the input selection encoder. And you can see it here as I'm showing you. Now, what you do not need to do is to desolder the encoder from the circuit board. You can see that there are four metal tabs. So if you just take a small flat blade screwdriver, you can just push them out of the way. Don't fully bend them over, but enough so you can then remove the front part of the encoder. And then here what you can see is the encoder which has been taken apart. And instead of the contacts being bright and shiny, what has happened here is that this is the original lubricating grease and also as well some degree of oxidization. Now when you get random switching, what is happening is that the microcontroller will read the selection and because it acts as an insulator, the old grease, one minute it will make a contact and then it won't. And sometimes it can be very confusing if you're doing fault finding and you're not familiar with this issue. You may think that it's got something to do with the microcontroller. Well it has in a way but not as a fault. The microcontroller is just simply reading what is happening. So what you need to do is to remove all of that old grease and then you'll see oxidization on the contacts. Then use a fiberglass pencil then just to remove all of that oxidization. Now the other point to make here is, is that once you reassemble the encoder and put it back into position you can just make out just to the edge of this photograph the red power LED. When you're inserting the circuit board back into the front bezel just make sure that you haven't accidentally bent the LED or if you're trying to align it that the LED gets bent because you may screw it all back in place and then find when you turn on the amplifier you can't see the power indication. Just make sure that it's straight and it slots into the receptacle. So once that work has been done, because we've replaced the large toroidal transformer, of course now what we'll need to do is to verify that the DC offset is correct for the two channels and then also verify that the bias setting is correct. So what I've done here is I've taken an extract from the service manual and this shows you the left channel. And there's two areas that we need to focus on. For this amplifier, it doesn't have like an automatic servo circuit where it automatically adjusts just to keep it within the specifications. So the way in which you would do your adjustments is, is very easy. So the first thing is leave the amplifier running, normally for about 20 to 30 minutes just to stabilize. You don't have any inputs connected or any speakers. You set your volume to minimum and then your balance treble controls to midpoint. And then you connect to the rear of the amplifier your multimeter leads and just set them to millivolts. So you're going to select, for example, here, the left channel, and you will repeat for the right channel. 
Now just be aware that you have the push buttons on the front to select system one and system two. So just make sure that you've got those pressed if you're going to be measuring the DC offset, because if you don't, then the speaker protection relays will not have energized and it will not be connecting the output stage to the speaker terminals on the back of the amp. And then what you're looking to do here is just to measure the miller voltage and for the left channel you're going to adjust the preset potentiometer which is V6003 to get to as close to zero miller volts as you possibly can and your tolerance there is plus or minus three miller volts and you just wait until that stabilizes make another adjustment until it's correct and then the next thing that you can then do is you can then adjust the bias and what you're doing here is that initially if you powered up the amplifier you'd set it to approximately 10 millivolts, but after the amplifier has been running for a period of time, then your final adjustment here, so it's V6001 preset, you're going to adjust it until your millivoltage measured across the test connectors is 20 millivolts, and you have a tolerance of plus or minus 0.5 millivolts. So here what I'm showing you is that work in practice. So you can just make out just to the right hand side the multimeter leads which are screwed in to the speaker terminals. And then if you look towards the multimeter, you can see that it's reading 9.65 millivolts. So it's high. So the adjustment then is made until we get it as close to zero millivolts as we can. So here you can see that now it's down to 0 0.9 millivolts or thereabouts. And then we repeat that exercise then for the other channel. And then here what you can see is the test connector which has been connected now for the left channel and you can see that it's running now at about 35.13 millivolts so it's running high but you know i'm not concerned because the transformer has been replaced and there could have been some drift over the years and all you do is you can just make up you know test leads that you can plug directly into these test sockets so you've got both hands free then to make the adjustment so here a little bit high and then we do the adjustment and it's down to 20 millivolts and the game repeat so you can see here now for the right channel high 38 millivolts and then the final adjustment we make then to pull it back to 20 millivolts here you can see from the top of the amplifier so left hand side you can now see the neutral oil has been installed there's so many amplifiers out there and I think this really is an aspect which sometimes I think is somewhat frustrating where you know these amplifiers are not that old and then for whatever reason they go off manufacture and then within a few years guess what you can't buy certain parts for the amplifier so if we didn't have in this case a replacement toroidal then you'd effectively be throwing away an excellent amplifier because there's no other issue with it and remember the transformer has failed because the turns on the primary went short circuit so if you were the owner and you paid quite a significant amount of money for one of these amplifiers like the owner I'd be somewhat disappointed if I couldn't get the unit repaired but in this case, we were able to restore it, and again, it will give many, many years of listening pleasure to the owner. So, as always with these amplifiers, after they go through repair, we just put it onto a soap test or to a bench test, normally for about four hours. Make sure that there's no underlying issue with the amplifier, and the amplifier was also cleaned up and then ready for dispatch back to the customer. So... That brings us to the end of this repair tutorial. So if you have any questions or you need any more information, by all means, email audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com and I'll be more than happy to come back to you and provide any assistance or guidance that you may require. So until the next time, I wish you all the very best. Cheers and bye-bye.